Here we go. Hi there. Thank you for listening to, downloading, and watching the Lean Into Artcast. This is a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when you go off on this adventure of, of communicating with images we think hard about this stuff so you will too my name is jersey drozd i am a cartoonist and teaching artist and the other host is uh hello i'm rob stenzinger i am a user experience designer i i do uh creative process coaching and also i make video games how are you doing jersey i'm i'm doing okay uh you know it, it was i've had a couple days where i got to just like sit down and focus on drawing which was a nice change of pace i've been bouncing around a lot of different a lot of different commitments lately we wear a lot of hats in this business and um but it was it was nice to have like some honest and for true flow state a little bit uh on monday getting to draw for like five hours in a row um you know it's it, one of the things that's like really challenging about uh, being a, a independent freelance or, uh, was there another word for it? Uh, you know, entrepreneur, um, entre sure. A solo. Yeah. Solo business. Yeah. Solo uh, business is, is that, uh, you, you, from a distance you think about it, it's like, Oh, I'm just going to draw all day and listen to YouTube videos. And that's what I tell students, you know, like when I do school visits and stuff I'm like, yeah, it's most of the job. I'm like, yeah, but there's also all this business where it's like, Oh, the phone is ringing. I've been playing phone tag with this person for like three weeks about this potential appearance that's happening down the road. I don't want to miss this call. Yes, I was in the middle of this really exciting drawing that I was really having a good time doing, but I got to take that call, that kind of thing. You know, those that happens, mm -hmm. right? So when you get five hours in a row of getting to focus on something, that feels like a gift. And I just wanted to acknowledge my gratitude for it. Um, how about you? Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, no, that that is a gift. Um, let's see. The I've been, uh, yeah, I mean, juggling a couple projects, uh, working on a new version of Guitar Fretter, working on you know various things with uh, launching the coaching business, and also the last couple of weeks, uh, my kiddos have uh, you know been like off of school and without daytime programming. So it's been up to me and my wife to do all that programming what have you i mean we're parents it's all good but like you know trying to to do that in in like this is a i don't know it's the end of summer vacation and it's not just like let's just you know blow it off and not do anything right let's you know be creative and come up with stuff which you know under that pressure you know you come up with some things we ended up uh we ended up doing sort of a special um, version of our family Kanban, which is probably, you know, nerdy, whatever. Kanban is this method of, of doing, uh, tracking your to-dos, like what's upcoming, what's done, what have you. It's a pretty easy thing. You visualize it with sticky notes or you can use, you know, use a dry erase board, whatever. Uh, we use sticky notes on the wall in the kitchen. And we made a special one for like this, this couple week block where it's like this whole list of ideas and exciting things on one side, but then there's like what we're doing today and then what's done. Cause every day it's like, let's go to a pool. Let's, you know, do this, let's do that. And you know, it's, it's a way to visualize, you know, you can fit a lot in a day, but there's a limit. Yeah. So, and also, Hey, there's more days. Let's keep, you know, let's keep some of these things for other days. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, cool. We haven't done that in a while where we do like a little quick catch up at the top of the episode. It almost turns into like a, like a little mini essay. We reflect on something that's been going on lately. And then we because we are who we are, we got to cap it with some kind of like encapsulating thought. Um, yeah, we just let's just just embrace it, Rob. Just lean into who we are. Uh, but this week we've got like if, you, if you're new to the show, if you haven't seen this before, it's uh, usually about an hour and it's usually we take a single topic and drill down as far as we can on it. And the first half is more of like a demonstration of what the topic looks like. What does it look like when we're engaging with that topic? And then the second half is how do we think about this topic? So this week it is viewing angle. What do I mean by viewing angle? Um, it, does, does that seem like a descriptive expression, Rob? Uh, I I started using this term about 10 years ago because I was getting, when I was a little bit younger and a little bit more um, 
uh, angry about things and I got very, very opinionated about things. Um, I was rebelling against the term camera angle in comics because there's no camera. There's no camera in comics. And it was partially born out of me reacting to this movement that was happening in like 2006, where like a lot of artists were like, I want my comic to feel like a, a movie. And I was like, I, I, I get what you're saying, but this is, there's just like this, this, this slight implication that movies are somehow superior to comics. And I don't like that. I like comics to feel like comics. So let's not use any movie language. Let's not use any cinema language. Let's just use comics language. It's not a camera angle. There's no camera. It's a viewing angle. We're viewing it from that angle. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, are you sure that this is a past concern? <laughs> <laughs> I'm much I'm much too mature now to get angry about this, Rob. <laughs> I'm very peaceful, darn it. I feel fine. We're gonna talk about viewing <laughs> showing intense look at the camera. <laughs> viewing angle, not camera angle. Exactly. Yeah. No, yeah, it's fun. Get... It's uh it, I totally get it. It's there there's a lot that can it's it's an important topic and i think the common accessible thing is, you know we deal with this all the time jargon gets used in different ways you you know a word is a symbol symbols can mean whatever the heck you want and you get stuff gets reused and um sometimes popularized outside of the the group of experts who um really was working on codifying their knowledge and describing it in a very specific way that created so much meaning. What can you do, right? So it's yeah. camera angle and viewing angle, <clears throat> you know, but, but if you're, if you think of like your head on your shoulders is a camera, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm in the habit of saying viewing angle now. It just, that's what naturally comes out of my mouth. But then I, I wanted to recognize the fact that just because I use this in my classrooms all the time, doesn't mean that's something that everybody else is using all the time. Um, I, I don't I see it's smart to point it out. Right. It's, yeah. I, yeah. We do encounter camera angle frequently. And uh, but I agree with you for the record. Viewing angle sounds like the most uh, meaningful way to describe uh, this. This uh, I guess it's a design concern in a way. Right. It's a, yeah, it is. Yeah, it, 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 angles mean things. Angles, viewing angle makes us feel things. And I feel like uh, this is something I run into with my students a lot where some of them automatically think this way for whatever reason. Maybe they, they've read a lot of comics, they've watched a lot of cinema, um, and it's just internalized. But then I also encounter students who everything is like on the horizontal, and maybe the, it, I can tell they're going for some kind of like tension building or big emotional breakthrough, but they're just not looking at things from different angles uh, to get there. Or at least if they did look at angles to get there, maybe it could be punched up a little bit further. Unless, and this is what we explore with the, with the individual students, maybe that sort of horizontal objective look at things is what they really want. But let's test that to find out if that's what you really want. So let's look at what our, what our options are. That's I think that's a very lean into arty way of approaching this, is not to prescribe, but more to say, like, before we use anything, let's use it thoughtfully, and let's see what all of our choices are before we make that thoughtful decision. That sounds excellent. And also, okay. is lean into arty the name of the guy on our logo? <laughs> It's that you know, Artie could be uh, uh, non gender specific because Artemis is uh, used for men and women. I knew a, a guy named Artemis and I've known women named Artemis. So, yes, Artemis or Artie for short, <laughs> lean into Artie. <laughs> it only took us 200, 284 episodes to get there. Iteration, it, you know, you, you get there eventually, right? <laughs> well we're modeling again all right so do you want to hit the music so that we can start doing this thing all right let's go get into the next section <laughs> i was wondering <laughs> if we're gonna do this all right <laughs> now we're in the part of the show so uh, i'm gonna switch over to clip studio paint and what we're gonna do to demo this is I thought you could give me some, and if anybody's in the chat who's watching, you can pick some emotion words to throw at me, and we'll look at, I'm going to try to quickly sketch 
a character experiencing that emotion and we'll look at some different angles to see how it changes that emotion. So um, we'll, we'll just demo a quick one. We'll do one with you first, Rob, and we'll leave some time for anybody watching live and wants to contribute in the chat. You, do you yeah. have an, an emotion word for me, Rob? So I pick an emotion word and then you, uh, using viewing angle, draw, mm -hmm. it, out, draw it out. I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna draw a character expressing that emotion from a variety of angles, so we can see how it variety. feels different. Okay, exciting, exciting. Um, okay, <clears throat> so I, I imagine a character um, in a. I, I, I see a few, you know, emotion ideas here, but like, what's that feeling when it's sort of an intense pit in your stomach, and the shock coming out of you, where where like you're you, some you realize that the and this could be like as as a we have to pick the age of the character or whatever but like in elementary school when someone you like like knows that you like them they find out and you're like oh no what do i do i i'm embarrassed and whatever but it's that kind of intense embarrassment where it's like the pit in your stomach plus the I'll tell you what I like about this this example you chose, Rob, is that there isn't a specific word for that, right? And this is where this is a very comic booky kind of thing where there's some emotions that you don't have a single eloquent word to sum it up. You have a lot of contextual information, you have a lot of examples, a lot of metaphors you can come up with, but you don't necessarily know the exact word. And and sometimes an image is much more communicative of that idea. So thank you for choosing something like that. Okay. So yeah, that, that, that horrifying moment of, of exposure, um, like exposure to criticism, exposure to honesty, exposure to, well, now I'm committed to this thing, right? Because like I expressed my feelings about this person and they're going to sure. either a reject secret. it. Yeah. A secret has been exposed. Yeah. Yeah, and, and now I have to, like, whether they reject me or whether they accept me, I'm now engaged in a thing, right? Before, it's, when it's secret, I'm not engaged, right? But now there's, like, connection between me oh, and someone yeah. else. Yeah, could, you could have been even satisfied, like, protected by the secret, but now your, your, your protection's gone. Right. I'm going to try to, I'm gonna try to keep this, like, for the most part, like, genderless stick bubble figure kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's let's start with straight on. Yep. <clears throat> Quick underdrawing of a of a head, human head. And Try to keep like are... kid proportions. Oh wow! Yeah, I see. Even already with the with the eye, the the wideness of the eyes, and then the 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 gaping of of the mouth. It's it's a uh, you know, this is it's surprise. But like, a, but a kind of surprise that has this uh, numbness to it, right? Because if someone, you know, if uh, whatever jokey Smurf gets you with the exploding box, um, and you might, that's a that's the your your mouth's wide open. It's like the, the you're you're letting something out, but this is almost like the surprises. Okay, so there's like one angle that we can do it at, like the straight on the subject <laughs> is in the center of the shot. And maybe we even have some contextual information, like other students are looking at the kid, like like they they know that this kid has been exposed. Um, okay, and so you you also described like a clenching, like like a a, a pit of your stomach kind of thing. Yeah, um, it's like oh no, they realize I wrote that letter. Or <clears throat> okay, Drew, that, uh, I... that that tribute to this person I care about on the board, but it was anonymous, but no one saw me do it, but now then everyone knows. So let's do like new angle, a new angle, looking at it from the, like slightly from the side. And now we can angle the person's body down a little bit and maybe even hint at that feeling of the pit of the stomach by like putting the hand over the stomach. Um, so we're talking about body. We're talking about viewing able. We're also talking a little bit about body language too. That's going to come into part of this, I imagine. And then there's, mm -hmm. here's yeah. our character being looked at by other Maybe. students. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So it's interesting. Both are fairly squarish panels to frame the image, but it's very different. Um. 
and maybe even put the other hand like protecting your middle the way like you know like animals you know like your underbelly is exposed kind of thing so like trying to hint at something primal that way okay so there's two now let's look at i'm going to shrink these a little bit because i've got a big piece of paper here and i do i need more space okay um so let's try another one but let's reverse the angle now let's do this now i'm going to make our person being exposed horizontally or vertically no, I'm just gonna I'm gonna flip it. So now we're looking from our character's point of view at the people who are seeing them being exposed. To now, I'm gonna show the person being exposed in the distance, and having all the people who are seeing who learn the secret looking from the foreground. Oh, okay. Wow. Let's see how that feels different. Okay. So there's so much every a lot of a lot of times when you get a lesson in uh, comics talking about uh, camera viewing angle, <clears throat> viewing angle, um, it's uh, often associated with the whole worm's eye, bird's eye thing, right? Mm -hmm. where, where, like, sort of the height of the of the of the camera, but you have the camera at a very similar height in each of these depictions so far. Right. So far, all we're dealing with is so we're dealing with depth of field, pretty much. That's all I'm playing with so far. But yes, I, you're you're anticipating my next move, which is I'm going to say like, okay, well, what happens if we look up at the character while they're realizing that they're exposed? Which is not an easy angle to draw people's faces from. We tend to look really distorted and funny when you look at a face from that angle. Um, mm hmm. Oh wow! Yeah, so this is the diff then now. This is more of the worm's eye view, right? Where yes, this would be worm's eye view. Where extreme. Let's put the hand on the stomach again, just like we did in the other panels, just to try to keep a little bit of consistency on that. And that's and so now you end up doing more um, like perspective foreshortening. Yep. It's this. This is very rough, but this is just to demonstrate the idea. So now we see the ceiling. It's not a comment on your pers on the accuracy of your perspective. It's it's uh it's just, <laughs> it's it is a really different angle. And now this person, this wow, I mean, we're we're right in there. And uh, right, and so now let's look at it from the reverse. Let's do it, some foreshortening the other way. Okay. Now we're gonna look down at the person. And this might be easier to show that sort of like the doubled over feeling. It's it's tougher at this angle to show like a bent spine, but mm -hmm. we could do it a little bit easier here. We could show the arms curling in in a protective way. Yeah, yeah. This this does emphasize the 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 doubled over a bit or you know a little bit more yeah yeah and so then we'd have the floor here lockers in the school or whatever right um how else could we do it well we could do more of an um uh, is it called isometric perspective isometric where you're at a 45 degree angle from mm -hmm. the side kind of thing mm-hmm mm -hmm. So we could do it like this, where we're looking isometric perspective down the hallway as the characters see. Mm. And this we would be focusing a little bit more on the distance between the character and the other characters, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We're making that much more plain. Here in these, the second and third ones, we have a sense of that distance. But, you know, as far as spatially in the panel, they're closer together than, well, maybe like here, that distance is roughly the same as that distance, but... There's, um, yeah, there's some padding, but the, the, it's not as obvious in the, in the, in like a 3D space. 
Mm-hmm. Another uh, way. So there's even more we could do. Let's. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm just hiding that layer for a moment. Let's mix. Let's mix some elements. So now let's go back to the people who are seeing the person exposed are in the foreground. And they're like, oh my gosh, we're in a room with shame. What's going to happen? Um, but now we take that center shot of and put them right in the middle here, but put them farther in the distance, lower in the shot. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, so we could do something like that. So, yeah, further toward the the other characters in the scene and further away from the main character. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so, let's see, any other angles that I can think of to do? Um, well, I mean, also, all of these shots, I think, for the most part, are. Well, except for the like that last one with the um, the perspective, where we're looking like sort of like a security camera view of it, of the scene. Um, That's our, a great our, term. Yeah, yeah, I, I use that to describe because I mean, if you think about it, like a security camera is just giving you information, right? It's not really giving you how a moment feels exactly. So I, I think of it as a more objective view, and I've got some slides that maybe we'll talk about in the second half of the show to demonstrate this idea of like the difference between like feeling like you're a subjective participant in the scene versus an objective viewer. Both have their value, right? Like this gives us. This gives us a very clear view of what the spatial relationships are between the characters in an unambiguous way, right? Whereas this one, um, it's a little bit more ambiguous. We still have some spatial relationships, but it'd be hard to, ga to gauge the exact distances and exact placement of all the characters. So uh, I would say, generally speaking, that this one, um, the third one that I did where they're all looking down the hall at the character, has more subjective emotion in it than say the security camera look of the scene um mm -hmm. so um let's see if i can figure out at least a couple more just to not be a sophist um let's see um well let's let's do this what happens if we make turn the camera as it were slightly on its side okay yeah so um hmm like rolling the viewing angle a bit oh my gosh i've got i've got my book science comics rockets right here where we talk about pitch yaw and uh roll and i forget which one is which because i put it in a book so i wouldn't have to remember to quote sean connery um so let's see uh, this would be Yaw is horizontal, pitch is up and down, like not. And roll, roll is this way. So we're rolling it. We're rolling the camera to yep. one side a little bit, right? And so now we can take that first shot, right? And how does that change the way it feels? How about this? Here's another way we can approach it. Ah, right. I was wondering about these these kind of angles. The like an intense close up. Yeah, like get right up in the, the see the character's eyes as they're having this this moment of realization. Um or let's back it out again and make them And have this. Okay. Oh, this is really. Really pulled back. And yeah. So now. Are in there? Is that is that the far? Yeah. The main. Oh, okay. yep. Yeah. The main character is like way in the background there. Right. And we fill the foreground with all the characters talking about the main character. And even though spatially, 
they're much closer to each other in terms of like the image. The character is much more isolated by virtue of the fact that there's such a size difference between them, right? Mm-hmm. So, so right there, you could see, um, you know, I think one more. My, if you're, you do one more. Yeah, it would be essentially the complete first person point of view. You're looking mm. like, oh, you are only seeing everyone reacting, looking at you, without seeing you. Yeah, it makes you the main character. Yep. I'm getting, you know, yeah, I know we'll talk and, and dig deeper in the, in the second half, but it's, it's really interesting. I, th- I think of how some of these uh, camera angles really play well in sequence. Mm. Mm-hmm. Sort of bringing, bringing you along a path of the emotion to potentially build the intensity. And, you know, it's because there can be sort of a relationship, uh, or, or a or feeling that clarifies by having a couple of these panels juxtaposed. Uh, surprise. It's comics. <laughs> it, because right. if, yeah, because it's almost like the, 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 the close up of the main character's face and then jumping to this, uh, this perspective of everyone looking at them, you know, that's, that that really conveys oh like yeah if, if this was panel one and this was panel two mm-hmm. like if the close-up of the character's face with the sweat bead and just looking at their eyes and then looking at panel two yeah that's that's an easy jump to make right like it's like okay we're seeing his eyes or her eyes and now we're seeing what they see right mm-hmm. um i feel like the jump between say if we did the shot of the character at it like where we've rolled the camera slightly and then go to the shot of the character of the what the character sees that's a little bit not quite as easy of a jump um, i agree yes it could it could still be made but it's it's not as clear little as going of, yeah a little bit of ambiguity there as far as like where where am i where has the storyteller put me as the reader Mm-hmm. where do i feel like i'm at in this and uh that's right there's it's more it's more ambiguous it's like well we're removed and then suddenly this other jump it's yeah it's it's followable followable but um you know mm-hmm. it's, it can be you can have a more intense progression by uh you know providing those links that all of a sudden like so the so the reader isn't just like pulled out of the story having to now do work to think through and piece things together Unless that's part of your point in your story, but wait, ah, let's. I'm, I was going to do one more, one more. Nice. Where I have a little bit of a delay because I'm watching the Twitch stream in mm-hmm. order to, right? So I'm trying to anticipate, but <laughs> so there. You know, like you could also do something like this where it's like, well, let's just remove the panel border altogether, remove all other data and just have the character floating in negative space like that, Um, which is playing with distance. It's also playing with context. It's playing a little bit with composition. Um, Yeah. Yeah. and, And not to take us down a rabbit hole about composition, but you could also do something like this. Like, um, and this is an example I use in my classrooms all the time is here is. an edgy teen who just got dumped and they're like, oh gee, life sucks. We go home and listen to some Nine Inch Nails, maybe some ministry. They don't understand me, man. And it's raining because it's always raining when you get dumped in a story. And then I asked the room, like, okay, what feelings is this character feeling? Oh, they're feeling anger. They're feeling betrayed. They're feeling heartbroken. They're feeling um, sad. They're feeling grumpy. They're feeling moody, et cetera, et cetera. And then I go, okay, well, let's do it again. Hmm. Oh, gosh. 
and I say, what feeling is this teenager feeling now? And they go, oh, lonely, right? Because mm-hmm. it's unambiguous. They're all alone. We've got that context now, right? So there's that too. It's like not to get too jazzy about it, but it's what you don't show and what you do show that tells the story. Um, so, yeah. So like when we think about and, these, yeah, go ahead. And also uh, what you show in sequence. Yeah, yeah, and what you show in sequence. Yes, the, the, the sequence matters a lot, right, in this viewing angle stuff. Um, and so, like, if you're doing a lot of, let's go back to my first examples. Let's look at that first row. And let's say you're doing a lot of shots on the horizontal. Um, maybe the point is you want it to feel relatively balanced and, and relatively speaking, calm. You don't want it to be too manic, right? Um, whereas changing the viewing angle a lot, let me get my pen back. Um, like say between these two panels, the one we're looking worm's eye view to bird's eye view, that might seem like we're really swinging people around a lot. They're going to be feeling the G-force of all of that movement, right? Um, whereas you feel less of it, at least the, the, your, our brains tell us that we feel less of it when you look at everything shot on the horizontal, shot after shot after shot. So yes, the, the context of the surrounding panels matters a ton. Uh, it's not just as simple as like, well, I want to spice this up, so let's just like do a, a bird's eye view. Um, why does it, why does a bird's eye view make us feel right? Like when we look at a shot where we're looking down at a character, it tends to communicate to us that that character feels less powerful. We feel um, we're elevated above them, and so we have the opportunity to feel either empathy for them, like oh, pity, you poor thing, or haha, look at you, you fool, you you, I'm exalted and you're down there. Whereas when we look up at a character, we tend to feel you know, like, like we're less powerful as the viewer than they are. Right. Or maybe, maybe the emotion, the pit of the stomach is so huge that it's like, it feels like a towering building over us. Right. Maybe it makes us feel more of a visceral connection with the emotion of the character. Right. Uh, I also think of the whole, like, is, is the, is there sort of an information going on with the, with the symbols and the viewing angle that's creating a rising or falling feeling? Mm-hmm. And so because looking up at a character can be them standing up and yeah. you're with them and cheering them on too it so if we do something like this yeah oh lord they yeah no whoop i keep hitting my windows button by accident if i do something like this the a thought balloon how does that change the way it feels too right yeah, you added more symbols, more information, and now, um, I mean, so that helps. I mean, that helps me as a reader, uh, I guess, go where you are intending as a as an author more more easily, right? Especially with the, you know, it's 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 thought balloons, thought bubbles, and it's not, um, you know, they they well saying it out loud, how it's being said, the shakiness of the balloons the the positioning of the lettering all that stuff there's a lot of uh um you there's voice in there so you can almost hear how someone might say this these thoughts even though it's mm-hmm. they're, they're silent in in, the, in this person's head and then yeah the 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 camera position the posture the 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 body language all that combines it's this reinforcing you know uh pile of information yeah yeah, there, there are. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. There, there are a lot of layers to this. Um, but in the, in the, in in a, what am I trying to say? In an effort to try to keep this simple and well, relatively simple and um, to a specific point, the thing that I wanted to illustrate is just that looking at things from different angles makes us feel differently about how the moment feels, right? Um, and, and these are all choices that are available to us and we should be exploring them. Like, so the, the reason this occurred to me is because I was doing a lot of thumbnailing this week and um, I was playing with this very idea on, on a page where I just like, I couldn't land how I wanted that emotion to feel, you know? And I, the shot that I picked was actually, it ended where we see a character from far away, like the characters like here, and like they're all in shadow and everything. And there's some characters in the foreground Actually, I take it back. If I remember right, this was over here. So I have these characters in the foreground, and we have like this menacing character in the center. Right? And then I did this shot where we see the menacing character here and the two people standing before them here. So I'm kind of like turning 
the shot around. And then I was like, okay, but now the character's going to deliver one of those big lines, those big like dun 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 lines, right? And the first sketch I did was this, right? Mm-hmm. Blah 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 blah, and this is all in shadow. Oh wow, jumping straight to that. And I thought, my initial thought was like, yeah, that works, but is that the best way to do it, right? And that's that's always my reflex is like, well, that feels right, but I don't know if it's correct unless I test it a bunch of times. So then I set it aside, and then I did like a version like this, where we're looking at them from the side, and we go, blah 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 right so maybe that is better because that sends us this direction off of the page for the page turn maybe i should do a shot where we're looking up at this character while they're giving the dun 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 line like this right so they're like a towering thing and you can even if you're thumbnailing clip studio paint like i am right now you could do a quick transformation edit transform free transform and we could even go whoop, really distort him there we go so now we're really looking up at this guy whoops didn't mean to do that so anyway but then yes I, after doing three or four different versions i was like nope that's actually the best one i was right the first time but now you know i've tested the idea and i know so yeah, and so part of it, it's like you have the economy of panels. You can always add another beat or moment, but then now that changes your your overall page composition. Mm-hmm. So all these different design tensions playing against one another. Um, you know, it's a, that whole, who said that thing about like your style is what you do wrong, right? Oh, it, that's attributed to Neil Adams. So yeah, Okay. Yeah, and uh, the, the thing that... Um, I haven't been producing as many comics in recent years, but but doing a little bit and any comic like things that I, that I work on going forward, I think about how um, like I have a big weakness of, of cramming too much information in, in too few panels. And so anyway, that's why I, I thought of that. It just, you know, it's almost like you, you have a bee in your body, you've got a grain of sand stuck in your glove or whatever, you're going to think of that thing. Um, but, but it, it's, and, you know, and that informs the choice too where I, I think I would end up trying to puzzle out adding a beat because of that, even though, yeah, I, I don't know if that would be objectively the best option. Because oh, yeah. it's really understandable to just go to, you know, one angle and one panel. I, and I want, I want to dog ear that. Hang on to that thought, because I think that that is going to figure into as we close out this episode. I think that there's some really good final thought information in there. Um as to like how this exploration of moment choice can, for better or worse, have uh, rippling effects in the overall design of the page. Because I, I very intentionally started with very square panels here, but what if your shot demands a non-square panel? What happens then, right? I'm so uh, guilty of, I of it's, it's like when in doubt, use a square panel. Um, use, you know, use a six grid or a nine grid. It's great, it's fine, it's clear, and... Mm-hmm. I can't, it's like, then I misbehave and I'm like, oh, I'm going to crank the angle on that. And that's going to make, make it feel more intense and fun or, or interesting. And yeah, I don't know, but that's it. I like that idea. Uh, it's a neat final thought to share the um, exploration of uh, the, uh, I guess the, what intertwining tensions between, you know, for a moment. Yeah. To- yeah. It, intertwining tensions and how that they can bolster and reinforce and affect one another in positive ways. Um because yeah, it's it's if you asked me what's the first thing you do, do you work out like the panel size or do you work out what's in the panels first? I'm like, uh, it depends. It depends on the moment. How clearly am I visualizing it? When I'm clearly visualizing the scene, I know what it looks like in my head, which is like I would say probably forty to fifty percent of the time, if I'm lucky. Um, then then the image dictates the panel shape. But sometimes I don't know what the image really is. I know that it, it feels kind of like this. I got this blurry image in my head and I got to sort of work it out. And then that that's when it can be like, well, I thought I needed a horizontal panel, but now I need a vertical based on the way as I, you know, noodle with and play with the idea. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, how you, you feel like taking a break for a second, Rob? Yeah, I think that sounds awesome. This was a, this was, was a great demo Jersey. Thank you. Cool. Um, bunch of fun angles and, uh, yeah, what, uh, but will we, we're going to dive into something after the break, right? Constraints that make us choose different viewing angles? Yeah. 
yeah, why choose different viewing angles? What are the reasons why we might choose different viewing angles? And I've got some like highfalutin artistic ones and some just simple aesthetic ones and some simple economical ones. Like some sometimes you just got to do it because it's, it's the best choice for getting the, the job done. But before we do that, so we're going to take a break and uh, talk about that. But before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. And where is my soundboard? There it is. And those are the folks who support us on Patreon. Yes, patreon.com. Come on, soundboard. There we go. Patreon.com slash Lena Tort is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you say, hey, I enjoy Lena Tort. I believe in Jersey. I believe in Rob. And I want to support what they do to help make it sustainable. How do I do it? Well, you go to patreon.com slash Lena Tort. You can contribute on a monthly basis for as little as a dollar a month. Or you can do a bigger amount and just do one month because you can cancel any time. You can just make your contribution, enjoy your month of content, and then, you know, check back in another time. And I want to thank five people who have been doing exactly that. First up, India Swift. Thank you, India, for believing in us and what we do. You can find India on Twitter at Old Swifty. And also, Rachel Ross. Thank you, Rachel, for supporting the show for so long and being a... Uh, an enthusiastic leaner. You can find Rachel on Twitter at NYC Terris, like T E R I S. Also, Jake, J S Taskis. Thank you, J S, for supporting us. You can find him on Twitter at J S Taskis. And Metal Witch Sketchbook Project. Thank you, Metal Witch Sketchbook Project, for believing in us and what we do. And finally, Chris Watkins. Thank you, Chris. It means a lot to us. So you can join them. At patreon.com slash lean into art, we will find every show we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place where only fellow leaners hang out. Patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you. It means a lot to us. It really does. It's, a, it's an awesome, supportive thing to do. We appreciate it. All right. So let's hit slowing down. Been running at a manic pace, Rob. Yeah. Making viewing angles angry person. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. For, so there's constraints and there's affordances. Constraints meaning like we've got different motivations, different uh, objectives. They're all bumping into one another to like help make this thing as good as can be. And then there's things that like just like help us leap up to the next level. There's like different, um, uh, there's viewing angles that help express something more eloquently, more clearly, more um, exciting, excitingly, um, more poetically, right? Um, so there's reasons to do it to make something just transmit a little bit better. And there's there's reasons to do it just because it's like, this is more expedient. This, this solves the problem so that other problems can have more space to be solved, right? I think that's that's the framework I was trying to set up there. So what are some of the driving motives for looking more deeply into the viewing angle of our work? Um, so I mean, isn't part of it like the, the gist of it is you have a I mean, you, you've got feeling and inf information to convey at the same time. Yeah. So and it's the, the balance between those two may differ depending on what the, this part of the story is or what your voice as a storyteller is, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you know, it might be that this this particular part of your story is more about communicating information so that the viewing angles that you use will might be adjusted to address that versus this is all about feelings, right? The, the classic example is shoujo manga, which, you know, when you read that, it's all about how the characters feel. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of abstract stuff and a lot of like getting really tight on characters to like show what their feelings are. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so. then, but even the action stuff too, it's like the whole, the language of moving the camera to extreme places that, that, I mean, we don't experience in our day-to-day -day life. Right. So I'm not suddenly hanging out on the ceiling, looking at people uh, like a security camera. I'm not suddenly, you know, tying my shoe, looking up at someone who's clutching their, their, their tummy going like, oh, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, like, but I don't, you don't typically experience those angles, right? Um, right. It's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of feeling there. And like to, in, in like both kind of, in, in even in like the, the action, it's like you are, uh, you're on a ride in a way. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the thing I say in my classroom is that like uh, a cartoonist's job is to, you know, invite people to feel things, <laughs> create images to invite people to feel things. That's kind of what you're, what you're trying to do. Uh, I got an example that I'll pull up and you'll have to see this on the Twitch stream, Twitch stream, Rob. This is one I've been using for literally a decade as an example. It's from one of my early works. And the difference between these two moments, right, is the first version, it's it's two moments from the same scene, right? So it's the same scene in the story. And um, there we go, get my interface out of the way. And the first one is establishing the blocking. Like, what is this? It's a classroom. What's happening in it? People are doing oral reports in the classroom, right? The teacher's at her desk. The students are at various levels of interest in the classroom. That's, that's what is important information in this scene. But the next panel, same scene, right? We're in the same classroom. It's moments later. And my main character is being humiliated by the classroom while he's making his oral report. And so where did I go, right? The first version, the first panel is looking down in that like security camera view. And the second panel is we're sitting in the classroom with the students. And it's unambiguous that we are there with them. And he is small and in the distance. He is, you know, um, surrounded, literally surrounded. Even the teacher's getting out of her chair, right? Um, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about viewing angles. Like, is it about identifying with the point of view of a character or how a character feels? Or is it about communicating information like you, the division you were making? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, totally see that. It's uh, uh, so how are you like? So what's your motive as a as a storyteller for for picking one angle or over another? And you mentioned different different sort of constraints, like you even like the uh, what'd you say efficiency or economy, right? Yeah. Um, but then aesthetics, and you see you had you had some like some big rules of thumb kind of ways of bucketing this uh, how do you do that what, what are those and what's the matchmaking that goes on um well what is the matchmaking that goes on so aesthetics like sometimes i'll choose a viewing angle because it just looks better it works with the visual sort of like composition of the entire page so that decision the decision isn't that for me at least it's not that fierce with every single panel it's like it's sort of like there's this um bureau <laughs> like using like the inside out metaphor, right? There's this bureau in my head and one of them is aesthetics. One of them is efficiency. One of them is like character POV and one of them is communicating information. They're all arguing amongst themselves all at the same time. And, and some will get louder and like, I'll be like, okay, this last moment should, I should close, I should close tight in the character because it's this, this moment where we're rounding out this emotional point in the story. And like, like we got to really show how this makes them feel desperate and alone and then the aesthetics person will jump up and say yeah but if you do a three-quarter down shot and pull back like 10 feet it's going to really work with the visual flow of this page and maybe you're not going to get that emotional oomph quite as much but you're going to have a much more clearer reading experience and then like the emotion guy will be like but no 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 i mean this is all about emotion we're supposed to make people feel things and aesthetics will pop up and say yes but we also want to make sure that everybody can read it and won't get stopped or stopped and confused by reading it right uh so does, does that describe that, that decision-making process? Okay. It sounds like a really hard process. And, <laughs> and at the same time, you know, so you have the, these different perspectives, these, these different uh, areas of concern, and it's like which one can win, uh, make the strongest case for mm -hmm. a, accomplishing story, right? Because inherently their case is their goal so it's not like a, you know, like each one of these, like you can, and you can think of um, like some comics, some creators, like I, I forget who made this, but I have a really like, I, I bought this in somewhere in my twenties or whatever, but this really huge Batman comic that is very um, oil painted looking. Right. And, and it's, it's, it's giant. It's, it's a visual, it's visually arresting. Um, I don't feel it's very emotional. Right. But it's but it was a fascinating thing to just explore as a as an object of curiosity that like clearly aesthetics showed up and was like, I win whole book, you know, and that's yeah. it. this book is mine. And and then, you know, but at the same time, you're, you're saying like, well, in the same book, you could, you know, per, by page, by panel, be having this debate with 
Yeah, yeah. Because like, let's say, like, let's say the the member of my bureau who represents expediency and economy, and I mean economy in term in this case in terms of like just get the work done and get it done on time. Like that 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 guy's like. He looks like a little uh, like 1960s like like uh, accountant CPA kind of like uh, caricature, and that character says, "Yeah, well, you know what? If you just zoom in on their eye and show the tear welling up in the <laughs> at the bottom lid, it's gonna be a lot easier to draw. You're gonna get your maximum, uh, you know, emotional impact. And hey, you tilt it this way, it might work with the composition, right?" And then the other guys, other guys all start yelling, saying, "Yeah, but that's cheating because that's like finding an easy way out." And expediency guys, like, "Yeah, well, you want to get the page done or not?" You know, so. <laughs> um, how interesting that that's uh, yeah, I guess I mean to be honest, expediency and information have have uh, have won so many of my debates, and also, <laughs> um, confused whimsy shows up and is like, "Hey, did you try this before?" <laughs> Uh, and I'm like, no, I haven't. You should try that. Okay, make make the you know make the panel really weird shape. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be like that. That character would look kind of like um. Oh, what was that character in Big Hero Six who was like the millionaire who was financing the team and he had like the the monster suit that shot fireballs. Oh, I forget. Yes, I can't remember, <laughs> remember the name, but yes. The guy was just like really excited to be there, but doesn't quite know what he's signing on for. Have you guys tried uh, this yet? No, man, let's try it. Um, and then sometimes moment choice and viewing angle can be looking for um, moments that suggest beginning, middle, and end at the same time. So like one of the things that I get very excited about in comics um, is how we're, we're telling a story with st static still images and there are certain cartoonists who can do it in such a way that you feel the movement. You and I don't mean like you feel the power necessarily. That's that can be like Walt Simonson. His comics are very powerful and very kinetic, uh, despite the fact they're a bunch of still images. But I mean, even like a sense of gentle movement. Um, you know, I, I I'm trying to think of examples of that. Like um, P. Craig Russell. Um, you know, creating moments that have a feeling of the wind is moving through this picture, right? Oh, it a lot have... of the establishing, um, establishing shots and sequences in like Wolf and Cub. Okay. Uh, lots of that where it just, you feel like you're going, you're, you're walking along a, a, um, a, what a feudal Japanese, you know, feudal era Japan road and, you know, encountering a circumstance, right? And, mm -hmm. and it just, brings you in through the sequence i want to i want to say i had some place um oh i okay, guess i don't you know, i'm curious what i know you're hmm. you're digging for something else too but like are you saying that sometimes it's easier to make the um the decision among the constraints and affordances and what viewing angles based on it's almost like buying a pack of angles <laughs> is easier than buying one angle Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, if you could elaborate on that. So I'm, I'm it's like if, if, if you had to, if you're, you're making a few angle choices at the same time, which mm -hmm. helps make all the choices as opposed to doing one panel at a time. Oh, I see. Are you, are you saying that by the beginning, middle and end, is that? Oh, no, no. I, what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about a moment choice of a single moment a viewing angle and like the, the, the composition of elements within that panel that suggests that sense of movement. So, um, so not, I'm not thinking about any of the surrounding panels at this point, at this point, I'm just thinking about like, what's a moment, what's a moment I can capture that, um, th that capture as, as much of the beginning, middle and end as possible or suggest them. I'll explain what I mean. And this is an old example I used to use on the art and story podcast. And it was from a podcast I listened to years before with a um, comic book writer talking about how difficult it is to write comics is that in a, in a film, in a TV show, in a movie, you can have a character walk through the front door of their apartment, hang up their coat, uh, turn on the television, pour themselves a highball and sit down. And that's a fluid, effortless movement. Right. And we don't we take it for granted that that's an easy thing to show. Well, relatively speaking, there's always constraints. But in a comic, you've got one, two, three, four, up to up to five discrete moments to show. Now, are you going to do that in five panels or are you going to find a moment 
that bridges multiple moments so that maybe we have the character with their hand, um, you know, in the background like like this, like like sort of over their shoulder, their hand is reaching back and we see the coat slouching onto the coat rack while their other hand has the remote clicking the thing, right? So now there's the intimation of like th things are all happening at once here. The coat just got hung and he picked up the remote and he's like turning on the TV kind of thing. Um, I, I've i required those. Like those, are, I, I think of those as a super moment. Yeah, yeah. It, I think that's a great way to describe it. And, uh, and, and so I see in comics sometimes, uh, where I get the sense that the person who's writing it is they're really thinking about it like film or animation because they're showing each discrete moment, which can have like a sort of like a staccato rhythm to it that may be purposeful. But sometimes I look at it and I'm like, well, yeah, well, you could have just like, you could have done those four panels in one panel and we would have had that sense of, um, that super moment, right? We're traveling across it and we're, we're getting the sense of movement. We, we are inferring it through the way you show it. So and that's what I mean by viewing angle in the case of that example of like, we're looking down at the person as the remote is pointing at the foreground, the hand is in the background and the coat is slouching on the coat rack. Um, so I look for that in my moment choices too. I'm not always successful at it. Um, you know, I mean, I would be hard pressed to find one of those moments in rockets. Well, I just found one. <laughs> you it up in less than one second. I, I was lucky, and I hit that. I I hit a page. So, like, we actually did a page where um, we did a, a one pan or like a, a splash page where we have you know Claude Ruggieri is throwing his plan for a solid fuel rocket over top of um, Robert Goddard's liquid fuel rocket, right? And while there isn't that much movement in it, it's multiple moments that are all captured in one. And we're, his balloons refer to the drawing that we're looking at repeatedly, right? So mm -hmm. that's an example of that kind of idea um, because that could have been six panels where we're looking at each individual piece when it's like, well, so maybe sometimes you just back away and show lots of things happening at the same time. Um, it depends on the story and it depends on what your bureau, if you have one, is arguing over at that particular moment. Um, so I would say that probably for most of us, that bureau happens invisibly. And for me, it does too. I mean, I'm making these choices at the thumbnail level um, without really thinking aloud about it. Right, it's only when I get stuck that I start thinking aloud about it. Most of the time, it's just it's, it's intuition. Um, so, I don't know where 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 do we stand? Anything else that, on this list, or are we coming up on final thought? Uh, I think that I think that it's uh, it's very fun. Can we list the what is the bureau again? Like oh. the official. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm I'm making this up literally on the show while we're talking about this. There's just something that just occurred to me. Uh, so there would be somebody there who's like I'm I'm the the director of delivering information, right? My job is for the clear transmission of who, what, where, when, and why, right? And then there's a there's a member who's like my job is to focus on how does everybody feel about this? How does the moment feel? How does the character feel? How do I create moments that that deliver a sense of feeling? And how do I create moments that um, uh, that tell us how the character feels? So that, and then there would be uh, somebody who's there for like the, the the chief director of aesthetics. Aesthetics being like how technically accurate is it drawn? How how beautiful is the image? How good is the composition? What's the reading flow like? Um, how does the composition contribute to clarity so that nobody is going to get stuck in the story? Is it is it uh, visually beautiful and effortless? Right. And then the fourth member that I came up with on the fly was the the uh, expediency characters like, well, I'm looking at a clock. We got to get this thing done. Um, th those would be and then like then maybe like the bonus fifth member would be the super moment person. Like this would be the, the, the pure comics person coming in and going like, can we make it pure comics? Can we make this something that would be impossible to do in other media? Um, I, I still get very excited about that idea, uh, although. I do. I, I listen to that person at my own peril sometimes because sometimes I wind up. I, I as I went back and I reread um, Boulder and Fleet Mining for Trouble, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, I realized that 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 book. Well, Rockets too. You described Rockets to me after you read it. You said like that book is relentless in its pacing, right? It's just like here we go. If you start the engine, it's just like duh, 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 duh. this is why Rockets are awesome for 114 pages. You know. Uh, 
And and I look at it, I'm like, yeah, it, there's a lot of information in there. And that was because Anne and I got very excited about like, okay, let's do something that you couldn't turn into animation, that you couldn't turn into film. Let's do something that like is like in its best state is a comic. That wasn't the primary objective of the book. The primary objective of the book was to get kids excited about STEM subjects um, and to be in an entertaining way, which I think we accomplished. Um, but we couldn't, you know, we couldn't avoid our excitement over what the medium can do. And I think Boulder and Fleet Mining for Trouble actually once like this is another example of me indulging in that uh, that member of the bureau too much. And I think I would do better to step back and let the let some pages just be grids. Um, because grids work for a reason. They're very clear and you don't have to, uh, you know, um, you don't have to flaunt what comics can do better than anybody else on every page, right? <laughs> well, so. I mean, it's it's a matter of taste and, and choice, right? That's where I think a lot of, you know, music genres come along where they are very <laughs> similar true. elements. That's true, yeah. Some genres, but then how those elements get put to use there's some people who listen to iron maiden and say what is that bass player doing why why is he like attacking me like this and then there's other people who go like this is amazing and i want to disappear into this tidal wave of notes you know (laughs) (laughs) yeah very much so and so um yeah it's a style thing it's a voice thing i mean that's 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 part of it too um your uh, the, the, the things you're aware of cho- and that you, you choose on purpose and the things that you just choose incidentally. So it all feeds into it, but it's a feedback loop, right? I mean, you, you have a chance to look back and, and uh, change your course, um, explore other genres of feeling and style with that. I know. Um, Cause I, and like I mentioned earlier, I now have a little, you know, um, a junior member of my bureau who is like, Add another moment. Take a breath. Why don't you come on? Like, s- stop cramming so much information. So, you know, <laughs> uh, it, by having those different concerns, it's not it's not a, a, cl- a mystery cloud of like, well, how is this having this effect or that or whatever. You you can you can make an intentional um, choice with your craft with it. So I th- that's why I wanted to revisit the. Uh, the I, I see. thought those were pretty functionally interesting. Um, I'm I'm glad I'm glad because we came up with that completely out of the blue that was not in the notes that was just like sort of thinking aloud about the idea and that's one of the benefits I get out of doing this show every week with you Rob um and now I wonder if I need to design little characters of those those like inside out type characters in my head to for use in classrooms um okay well are we at a good breaking point again to take one more break and then come back with final thought yeah I think so I mean we um we were kicking around the idea of that, uh, the sort of the, the intertwined tensions for a moment choice. Yeah. Um, is that what we're going to mm-hmm. do? And, and how, like, you know, it, it's not a linear progression for me. It's not like, Oh, I just on my panels and then I put the images in the panels. That's all, you know, I, I'd make the balloons and then I put the words in the balloons. That's all. That sounds incredibly congruent with a post industrial revolution assembly line way of making things. But that is not how, in my experience, how art is made. Um, there are procedures, but sometimes those procedures affect and, and uh, inform one another in interesting ways. So, all right. Uh, we'll talk about that in about a minute and a half, maybe two minutes. First, we've got to thank some more people who make this show possible. Uh, and those people happen to be us. We make this show possible by making things all the time and then uh, bringing the thoughts that occur to us while we're making things to this show. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire. And it is a story about a bear and a bird who are best friends who decided they want to go into business together adventuring. Like, hey, let's go save people from dangerous situations. Let's go retrieve treasures. Let's go um, stop some bandits. And maybe we can become famous at doing it. Well, the only problem is this ambitious little bird fleet has partnered with this bear who is very gentle and would rather make friends than uh, solve adventures. And so it's always an uphill climb for her to get him involved into the adventure. But when he does, he's extremely effective. He's a very powerful and caring bear. Um, 
And Mining for Trouble is the story where they encounter this group of mineral bandits who have taken over a mine because these mineral people survive on uh, precious metals. And so what better place for them to, to you know, they're not going to rob banks. Um, they're going to rob mines. And so uh, there, there is a battle involved and Boulder finds his own way of solving the problem. You can purchase it at books.jdros.com. And you can see all the different kinds of moment choices that I use in this book. I, I kind of go all over the place because it's a very... Uh, my uh, log line for my personal objective with the book is like, how can I do exciting action adventure with a pacifist character? Um, Books.jdros.com. Rob, you make lots of things. What's one of the things that you want to talk about? You want to talk about your consulting? Yeah, let's let's talk about that. So um, yeah, in in, uh, in recent weeks, I have uh, launched a coaching business actually along with uh, with my wife, Kate. Um, I mean, Kate has, I mean, she's, she is a, a trained therapist and she's a, you know, person that juggles a bunch of things just like I do. And, and, uh, but then, you know, recently we kind of realized we have, we've had this path in common of, of sort of teaching, mentoring, coaching. And so this, this, you know, put, you know, put that through a few weeks of, of, uh, you know, product launch stuff. And, and we, we're, we've got a coaching business here and it's like, you got uh, Kate. You can find her quickly via uh, mycoachkate.com. You can find my coaching quickly via um, uh, robcoach.me, and really easy to to get to to us via that or the URL on the screen. And so what Kate's doing is she's coaching entrepreneurial couple, couples. So you know, you maybe one of you is starting a business, maybe both of you are together, and you know, you've got a lot of lot of things and roles going on. There's probably something that you're working on that is stuck or keeps you up at night. And that's where the coaching can sort of help you work, you know, work together with you to um, navigate forward and, and get toward those big goals. And similar with me where it's, uh, I'm, I'm more about the, the sort of, um, if I had to be hyper specific, I would say I coach a lot of kinds of folks who are creators, but I would, but more toward like I help maker leaders build great teams and meaningful products. And if I look back at my career, this is what I've done over and over. And now I'm just trying to help other people do the same. So uh, that's, you know, the business is, is launching. You can get in on the, you know, at that start, right? Where we're doing free discovery sessions. Just, you know, come on and, and see what, what's this coaching about? How can it help you? There probably is something that you're working to achieve that, uh, you know, coaching helps you level up. It's not therapy. It doesn't prescribe. It's no guru thing. It's, it's this weird upgrade, like when you experience it, where your brain has another brain caring a heck of a lot about what you're trying to get done and helps you move forward. So there you go. Check more out at uh, um, robcoach.me or uh, coachkate.com. And shieldstenzinger.com. All these will be in the show notes as well. Um, if you're here because you like the way we think about stuff more than the way the stuff we make, fair enough. This show is a thing that we make and we have more things like it at leanintoart.com slash workshops where you can download self-contained videos at a price of your choosing, even free. And I want to say if you uh, actually download my Comics Fundamentals course that I placed, put up there years ago, uh, one of the things you'll get is the video workshop of sequences and consequences, which ties in directly to the topic for this week's episode. In that, it is a series of, it's a discussion on various uh, storytelling techniques, layout, moment choice, talk a lot about that in there. Um, and we also, I think this, this is the, the workshop where, yes, we talk about how moment choice can communicate time, moment choice can communicate tension, and then even just making things more visually interesting, giving you a sense of being there. And then there's an exercise at the end where I tell a story. Uh, and the story is, oh, what am I trying to say? It's, it's a bunch of objective statements without any kind of emotional value judgment placed against them. So a person walks down an alleyway, they look at their watch or they look at their phone. What's on their phone disturbs them. There's something pursuing them. They look for a place to hide. And you are invited to create a story based on that's uh, you, you draw a comic based on that story on individual index cards, and then we rearrange the cards to see if we can find an equally valid story. And I've been teaching this workshop for six, seven years now, and it's always interesting to see how the tone of the story changes based on the moment choices that you choose and the order in which you place them. So you can get that at leanintoart.com slash workshops. If you're watching this video on you know YouTube, on Twitch, um, if you're on Twitch, 
Share the video. Um, if you're on YouTube, giving it a thumbs up to help some more people find the show. If you're listening to it, a podcatcher like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, giving us a five-star review wherever you listen to us uh, helps more people find the show and it helps us a lot. Thank you to everybody who has been doing exactly those things. That's awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, final thought. So I actually have an example here of a page that changed as a result of um, a layout that changed as a result of like what I needed to show. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. I'm super curious. Is this is an example you've shared before, or is it? Yes. Yeah. This goes back a ways. Um, so uh, this is a sequence from an old comic that I did back in like 2006 called The Replacements. I worked on it with Sarah Turner. It's actually you can still get it on IndiePlanet.com if you want to read. It. It's like like 200 pages. Um, I'm actually pretty pleased with the book, despite the fact that we wrote it largely on the fly. It was a web comic that we serialized and was making it up as we went along. And I feel like it it kind of ended in a good place. Um, but in this sequence. We have, I won't go into great detail, but it's um, this this celebrity who's being confronted by a fan who is not a troll. This is a fan who learned that there's like a, a dark secret about this celebrity. Um, and he is just, he, he needs to communicate his sense of betrayal to that celebrity. And so there's this confrontation, right? And it's full of all these different kinds of emotional moment choices where like the celebrity looks up and he sees this guy standing in front of him and look at the, the moment choice that I, I chose, or the viewing angle rather, we're looking up at the character, right? So he just, and he's not saying anything. So it's this like, well, I'm leaving it up to you to feel like, uh, what's the conclusion we come to? Well, he's kind of imposing and kind of, um, uh, what were you going to say, Rob? Well, I mean, there's ambiguity. Ambiguity yeah. incre uh, adds tension. Just like yeah. a person just looming up and they didn't even say anything. If they would have been like sup or anything there, it's just like, oh, okay, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Invites tension. Right. Yeah, there we go. So there's like a moment choice of tension. But this final moment, so like he, he verbally attacks the celebrity and the celebrity knows he's right. And... And then he even, the, the the fan even says like, well, that's not even what I'm really angry about. What I'm really angry about is like all the young people who look up to you and someday they're going to find out and my heart is breaking for them, you know? And then he walks away and leaves the guy alone. And as Sarah and I were designing the page, we were like, well, that final moment after the fan walks away, is there a way we can show the emotion of all of that guilt, shame, and secrecy like sort of weighing down on the guy without doing like a psychedelic drawing, right? Can we do it in a way where we're abstractly showing that in nor like like when you have a secret of that of, of that kind, some kind of shameful thing that you you don't want everybody to find out about, and somebody called you out on it, and they're like, and guess what? The time is coming where the world will know. How do you show that visually? And so. I can't remember which one of us, this is so long ago, this was like, you know, 13 years ago, but like which one of us came up with the idea of like, well, maybe it's like just like darkness, just sort of like falling down on top of them, like like a, a dark wave coming down. And that meant that we needed to end the page on a tall panel, right? So that means that, at, so as we were thumbnailing and working out the the scene here, you know, we knew we wanted to get in close and tight on the guy's eyes to show like that sense of like, uh, I'm right in your face and I'm feeling that betrayal. But I, we knew that we could only go so far down the page and that the, the, the following panels needed to be tall in order to accommodate that final moment on the page. Does that make sense? It makes sense. It sounds like, so you picked sort of like an anchoring moment and it, it influenced the rest of the composition. Yeah. Yeah. And... And it, it 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 was such it felt so visceral and so, like such a visually good idea like so we even drained the color out of the character right like all of his color is gone in that final moment, um, but it, it felt like visually it felt like such a like I could see it the moment we were talking it through, so that meant that that moment informed everything that preceded it 
right? Um, yeah, we're going to do a close-up eye shot. We know we want to have that in there. Uh, but what does that mean for everything else? Well, okay, well, let's do like a horizontal on the first one to show like the spatial relationship. So here's where information bureaucrat comes into play. It's like, okay, well, let's show the spatial relationship between them. Okay, then emotional guy comes in is like, okay, but let's get in tight on those eyes so we can see that sense of anger, betrayal. And then aesthetics person comes in and says, on the next panel, let's try to create a moment. Well, actually, this would be more of emotion guy saying, can we show it from an angle where the celebrity feels small and trapped. Oh, well, let's look up underneath the fan's arms as his arms surround the guy visually. He's not literally surrounding him with his arms, but we create an image that surrounds the guy figuratively with the fan's arms. And then let's go back to information guy, fan walks away, and then finally emotion guy takes over once more. Hmm. That's a pretty good duo. Like if, if, if information and emotion uh, are dancing together between <laughs> a panel and a panel that's that's a that provides a, a nice framework to think think of as like a rhythm of uh, making sure both are represented because both are important mm-hmm. and that's that's really interesting the other thing i hear here too it reminds me of two things where you you pick that that key moment it reminds me of keyframing in animation where there's mm. this position or posture where the character is like super unambiguously doing a thing, winding up for a pitch or about to sneeze or something. Right. And there's kind of um, like the, there are key frames with that help really clearly communicate the, the progression there. Right. And so, but another thing is, is that old advice where you hear, well, start like know your ending, start with your ending. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really interesting um, to, to, I don't know, to me that, there, I, I hear kind of echoes of that in in your um, in your process that you describe. Yeah, I mean, I I don't always know where every page is going to end. Although, well, yes and no. So uh, a thing that I do nowadays that I didn't do before, and let me turn on the cameras again so I can actually show this example, um, is I actually outline my books in text like so. I'm holding up like what you're looking at. This is, it looks like prose, it's just paragraphs of information. But then if I go to any one of the pages, um, I don't know if you can see, but like I will mark up in blue line where each, which, which moments are a panel and which moments are the end of the page, right? So I'll be like, okay, this paragraph is is pages 29 and 30 right there like that's i know that that information will fit in pages 29 and 30 but then i'll go through and i'll mark out like that feels like that's a panel that feels like that's a panel um and this feels like that's where the page needs to end so that's that's a, a method that i've been using in recent days to sort of begin mapping out how that bureau is going to fight out that fight and then as we talked about in the episode sticky note writing then I go through and do little tiny thumbnail sketches. And so, and there are various comic page on a single, yeah. what was it? Three by three sticky note. Yep. One whole comic page on a three by three sticky note. And as you can see on the screen, it's almost impossible to tell what's actually happening on there. I can tell because I drew it and I know what I was visualizing while I was drawing it. But, um, so yeah, I guess like because of that, I do have a sense of what, how, how each page is going to end and depending on what the moments are, there's different anchor panels. So sometimes an anchor panel, like for instance, I don't like to do um, captions that say, meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice, I like to show that we're heading to the Hall of Justice. And sometimes that can be exterior shot of the place with like a, you know, at the beginning of a conversation word bloom coming out of the building, or it could be we jump right into the place. And if we're jumping right into the place, that becomes the anchor panel because now I have to establish very clearly and visually we are in a different location than we were previously. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it, anchor panels can come out of an emotional need or um, a plot need or a, just a clarity need. Right. I, I need to communicate that we've changed scenes. Uh, this is, I need to show unambiguously that these characters are no longer in the same place, right? They're separated now. So how often really do the tensions pop up? Because I'm wondering this, if you have like this, the, um, you, you have your process, there's, you know, broad brush, there's a, there's, there's kind of a generally followed process for the progression of, I have a concept for a comic to like, I have a finished comic and you go, you, you, you develop through a series of, 
discrete efforts to clarify what you're trying to do. And, to, and it goes from like planning to execution kind of seamlessly, like the, the comic development process. Is that, um, are there places in the process that you have encountered a lot of tension? Yeah. Between, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in, 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 a lot. Because it almost, I was almost hearing like maybe it actually doesn't happen that often because of your development. Mm, I, I haven't sat down to measure it, um, but it happens enough that I notice it, and and it happens when I've got scenes. This goes back to the very beginning of this discussion when you picked a emotion that is not very easy to define, right? It's a feeling in your gut. It's a feeling of exposure. It's a feeling of right, it, it feels all these different ways. There are scenes that I write in my outlines sometimes where I know what I'm going for. I know I'm going for this feeling. Well, I don't know what that looks like yet. And when I don't know what it looks like ahead of time, then it gets hard, right? So there was a scene in... Um, okay, so we're going to go back to this this book. Um, this is a book that I did like almost two years ago now, Captain Seriously and the Supermaster Sentinels. And I had a moment where a character experiences like tremendous grief, right? Uh, unambiguously enormous grief. I had the scene in my head the moment I, I conceptualized that in the story as I was writing out the outline. This character experiences enormous grief. And then these two characters who care about each other fall into each other's arms to express that grief together, right? I I could picture it when I wrote it. So that what that, that's when it's seamless. But when it's like, um, and actually I could show the scene. Here's, right? So it's like, there's the character looking up at the sky and screaming a, a soundless scream and then they fall into each other's arms kind of thing mm. instantly pictured it in my yeah. head That's um nice. but when it's something that i don't have a clear picture of and i sort of have um I'll say future Jersey can figure that one out. <laughs> that's when that tension comes in and that's when the bureau is fully activated, right? So <laughs> all right. So you you you're you're laying a little, you know, uh puzzle trap for your future self yep yeah and and those are the days where um steven pressfield's resistance like shows up and is all powerful because like i'll sit down and i'll be like oh i didn't figure this one out ahead of time i'm gonna have to like you know discuss this amongst myself to figure out how like how to sort out this scene and i'll be like oh you know what the dishes really need to be washed <laughs> okay. ah. that's awesome all right. Do we do a well, do we do a podcast? I I think it makes sense that that sometimes the 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 result of the process means it's maybe it's it's a good time to to take a break and and do the dishes <laughs> before picking the camera angle. <laughs> Actually, yes. Takeaway among many takeaways. So yeah, yeah. I think we did a podcast. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you, Rob, for you know showing up every week to do the show with me, and uh, you know helping me explore these topics and discover new ways of thinking about it. And uh, thanks everybody for downloading, listening and watching. We record the show every Thursday at noon Eastern time, uh, 11 a.m. Central time. We stream it live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash lean into art. And then we collect that as a podcast at lean into art.com and patreon.com slash lean into art. We will be back next week with another episode. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and I'm Rob Stenzinger at places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. <laughs>